Uh, cool. Um, hi guys, uh, I'm Sharon. Uh, I'm working uh, as a senior developer artificial intelligence in Coworks. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about PyTorch uh, on the basis of why did I switch. So we used to use TensorFlow before. My team still uses TensorFlow. And I'm the only one who took the uh, risk of moving to PyTorch. And I'm trying to convince them. And I'm trying to convince you guys. Uh, OK. Uh, yeah, so uh, I work, as, work in Coworks uh, again. And we have a small research team. We called, uh, call it as Coworks Labs. Uh, we uh, do research on uh, uh, middleoutvectors.github.io. We can go there and see what it is. Uh, we, it's it's uh, in the area of uh, word embeddings. Uh, so uh, I go by HH second in internet. Uh, that's a whole another story. Uh, so wherever I am in, you can go and find me as HH second. Cool. Okay, let's start. This is the gist of my talk. Uh, so when I started preparing the talk, I thought the major difference of PyTorch from all of the popular deep learning framework is this dynamic capabilities. So I thought, so I thought I should start with what is a computational graph and what are the different computational graphs, uh, right? Uh, so uh, we're gonna go through that, and we I'm gonna give a general introduction to PyTorch so that you guys will get comfortable with uh, the advance of the the decent amount of coding that I've put uh, across in the next session. Uh, so the next session is where the actual talk starts, why did I switch and why why should you switch? And then I have some bonus points, uh, only if uh, I have time to explain. Uh, so if you guys want me to take the bonus point, be alert and be attentive, or at least give me that face. Uh, okay, cool. Okay, so uh, as you guys probably are aware, computational graphs or uh, the, what we are doing with deep learning is trying to optimize some mathematical function, some Jane mathematical function, and we're trying to find the parameters which could actually solve this function and give you a result, right? So we are trying to find a function for any issue or for any problem that we find in universe, and we are setting up a deep learning network, and we are trying to optimize the parameters. That's all about it. So it's all math, right? You can just do it by hand. The, the question is, do you want to do it by hand? So this is uh, a, a small snippet that I took from the original LSTM paper of 1997. So this is the complexity of mathematical equation that you will have to solve uh, to get uh, the, the, the solution of the function that you're trying to solve. And probably the function, so this is like a, just, just a small snippet uh, from the LSTM paper. So there should be a better way to do it, right? So that's how people come up with this graph approach. You picturize the whole math function that you have as a graph, and you can do a lot more, or at least it's intuitive for you, right? When you look at that graph, you exactly know how the whole flow happens, much better than how you look into that equation. So it's a hyperbolic tangent on uh, two matrix addition of two matrix multiplication results, uh, right? Uh, so this is extremely useful when you start dealing with more complex graph, and the complexity exponentiate as you go, uh, as, as you start building a really complex, uh, really big graph. So this is another computational graph, which is a representation of Google inception model that has around 100 layers. And there is no way, it's almost impossible for you to do it, in, uh, it by hand or by program if you don't have this approach of computational graph. Uh, so you implement that by computational graph, then and the advantage of having this graph representation is you can traverse through this graph whenever you want to where, wherever you want, and you can take the gradient along with you and update whatever weight you want or whatever parameters you want, uh, and you could actually use that for getting a better solution. Okay, so uh, right now I'm done with the computational graph, and we're going to start discuss about two approaches that people have taken towards this computational graph. The first one is the static approach, which is this traditional way of approaching uh, computational graph. Uh, so MXNet, uh, TensorFlow, Theano, all those popular deep learning frameworks have implemented based on the static graph approach. So in static graph, what you are essentially doing is compute, a, compute your graph beforehand and keep it with you. Basically, the framework tries to optimize the graph definition that you have written and keep that in the memory and you loop through your data and feed this data to your graph, right? So the, the, the only thing that you guys should be looking at is where the loop happening. 
you are looping through your data and the graph definition is outside that loop, right? Uh, so the difference in dynamic graph is you are not defining your graph beforehand. You are defining your graph. The graph definition is inside the loop where you iterate through your data. So PyTorch is not the first framework that implements dynamic uh, graphs. Uh, we had uh, Autograph from Harvard almost four years back, and we have got Chainer, we have got Dynet. But the problem was all, all this graph, uh, dynamic graph frameworks were concentrating on uh, research. So what PyTorch did is they took the front end of Chainer and they merged that with the back end of Torch, which is a well-known, well-tested, and super fast framework, and you have a GPU optimized graph that has dynamic capabilities through PyTorch. Okay, so I have a small example here which uh, is doing the XOR operation in PyTorch and TensorFlow. So I don't want you guys to look the other part of the code. The only part that I want you to look is this uh, uh, the loop. So first we look in the TensorFlow. So if you look at the first line, uh, we are adding the bias and the result from the matrix multiplication. So when, when you add those two variables, those two variables does not have data in it, right? It's just the placeholders. So there's no mathematics happening there. It's just a placeholder, and your, your the TensorFlow is trying to make a graph definition in the back end and keeping it in the memory. So, it, so that, that square in TensorFlow is uh, the graph definition, which is outside your... Uh, loop and now you are looping through your data uh, here uh, so basically it's looping through the epoch and trying to feed the data into that graph right so the graph building happening only once and in, uh, in the case of PyTorch the graph definition the all metrics multiplication everything is happening inside that loop and you have data in all those variables so dot mm of w1 you have data in x do you have data in w1 and the computation happening when the interpreter reaches that line right it's not waiting for the data to be fed in the future okay so let's uh do a getting started with pytorch okay so this is uh, the home page of pytorch and uh, it's, they have a decent ui uh, you have a couple of buttons there. You select your option, Linux, Windows. I don't think Win they do support Windows, but OS and other options, and you get a command. Uh, you just in your, paste in your terminal, and you are ready to go with PyTorch. Uh, you import Torch. You don't import PyTorch. And so when the core developers started thinking about PyTorch, they want it to be as similar to NumPy so that a beginner who started coding in NumPy should be easily able to migrate to PyTorch. Uh, so this is how you create a random matrix. You have another option, tensor, and uh, you take x dot size for getting the shape, which is actually uh, an object which is inherited from Python tuples. So you can do all the operations that you could do on Python tuple. And you can uh, index, you can do slicing, uh, just like how uh, you do on Python list on all the dimensions. Um, so I'm, do I'm, taking, I'm doing some slicing on the second dimension there. Okay, so another important factor about PyTorch is you have this NumPy bridge, and if your data set is stored in, as a NumPy array, you can just convert it to a PyTorch tensor by calling from underscore NumPy function, or you can convert a PyTorch tensor to NumPy by calling uh, x dot NumPy. You'll get a NumPy array back. Um, okay, uh, so another uh, important difference between TensorFlow and PyTorch is if you want to do a GPU operation in TensorFlow, you will have to install GPU version of TensorFlow, right? But PyTorch does not come as a two version. It does have only one version. And if you, so when you do an X plus Y, the operation is happening on your CPU. And the moment you want to convert back to GPU, uh, you, do, you call x.cuda and you get a uh, GPU tensor back. So if you look at here, so the same operation I'm doing here, but it's happening on GPU, uh, right? So I've often see, seen this approach in PyTorch code where people create CPU tensors and do their CPU optimized operation in CPU. And the moment they need the parallelization, the moment they need uh, the GPU optimization, they convert it to CUDA and do the operation there. And if they need that tensor back to CPU, they again convert it back to CPU by calling dot CPU method, which is really handy 
especially if you're worried about, worried about uh, the CPU optimization and GPU optimization issues. Okay, so this is really important. Uh, this is basically the backbone of PyTorch, the Autograd package, which is actually responsible for doing the automatic differentiation for you. And Autograd has a module called Variable that has data grad and create in it. So data is intuitive, so it's, it has the data in it. When you want your number to be an integer, a Python integer, you just call data and you'll get that, uh, that data, ob the data Python uh, object back. And you'll have your grad gradient in the dot grad object. So when you do a backward pass, all the data is, all the gradient is gonna uh, be accumulated in dot grad object. And PyTorch does not do, PyTorch does not update your data automatically. It'll wait for you. It'll just accumulate the gradient in dot grad object. And you are responsible for updating your weight. Uh, yeah, updating your parameters. So dot creator is uh, probably the most interesting thing among these three. Uh, so this is how PyTorch keep the, keeps the whole graph together, right? So any node will have its creator in dot creator object, and you can traverse from one node to any node by calling dot creator and dot creator on the dot the creator of that particular object. Um, yeah. So I okay. So. The next object in PyTorch Autograd is functional module. It has addition. So when you do an X plus Y, the plus is the functional module. Plus is part of the functional module. Or when you do a tanh operation, the tanh is part of the uh, functional module. So basically, the dot create object that I was talking about is pointing to a functional object because when you do a, when you, when you take two tensors and do an addition, you get it another tensor which actually created by this addition operation. Okay. So this is the auto, the whole, the parent autograd package. So as per the website says, this is the central to all neural networks in PyTorch. And you can, you, it has all this uh, automatic differentiation uh, methods in it. Okay, so this is a typical example given by uh, the PyTorch website to show the dynamic capabilities. So when the interpreter is at the, the last line, w underscore x is equal to variable, it has data in it. And that only the four, only the nodes created in the graph is that th those four nodes, right? PyTorch d have no clue about what is going to come next. What should be the what would be the graph structure in the future? And when the interpreter reaches this two line, the matrix multiplication it creates that, then it'll do the addition, and then do the tanh. So as the interpreter reach, re reaches each line, that's when PyTorch creates your graph. And when you do a dot backward, you do the backward pass. So in the next iteration, the graph structure could be different. Doesn't really matter. It, in each iteration, it, it, you can actually dynamically create any graph structure you want. And when you do the backward pass, it'll backward through the graph you created in that iteration, right? Cool. Uh, yeah, I have uh, uh, the Jupyter notebook with some code in it. So yeah, x is a variable, a PyTorch variable, and I'm trying to print x dot grad and x dot data there. Uh, so grad does not have any value in it because I haven't done my backward pass, and x dot data is 12.3, which is a floating point number. Okay, so I'm doing the functional operation there. So I'm tr trying to take the power and trying to multiply and do a subtraction, and then passing that to the hyperbolic tangent, and then I'm doing the backward, right? So when I execute that, the graph created by till the z z variable is being backpropagated. And now I, when I try to print the same thing that I tried to print on the second line, I have the gradient in x.grad, it's zero because there is no gradient, and uh, the data is same. So it, it would not update the data when you do the backward pass. Cool, so this is probably the interesting part. Uh, so you can try printing the creator of z, and it says the tanh function. And from the same z, you can try to print z.creator.previous function, and it'll give you the multiplication operator. You can traverse from z, so then the third line I'm trying to print the creator of creator of creator of z. So from the z, from the last node, I can traverse back to any node I want by calling the dot creator function, dot creator object. Cool, this is just a pictorial representation of the same. So I have this x variable, uh, it's, uh, there's a function f and there's a function g. So all this is connected by the creator uh, object that you have. Okay, cool. So I'm, I'm done with 
uh, the introduction, now we start the actual talk. Why? Why did I switch or why should you switch? So basically, I'm not, uh, I'm not saying PyTorch is better than TensorFlow in any means. But what I'm trying to say is there, are, there were specific reasons which Py, uh, the TensorFlow did not work for me well and PyTorch did. So if you guys have the same reason, if you guys are worried about the same reason, uh, the same thing in your day-to-day uh, -day job, you should probably to take the decision that I did. Okay. So these are a couple of tweets that I took from last month, I guess. Uh, so it has, I guess, a couple of funny uh, tweets. Uh, okay, you guys can read it later. Okay, uh, so these are the four reasons that I want to put across to you to convince you that you should switch. They got the abstraction right. Uh, so torch.f has all the functional module. Torch. where autograd has all the things that related to automatic differentiation. And they have got their high-level module just like Keras. Uh, so Keras of TensorFlow is torch.nn. So you have all the high-level uh, layers in torch.nn. You, you have the sequential module. You have your linear layer. You have your ReLU layer. You can just call it by torch.nn dot the layer name. Um, OK, so I want you guys to do me a favor, right? So this is a network that does the reduction. And I want you guys to rem remember this network is doing reduction. So basically what it's doing is it's taking two words, the embedding of two words at a time, and squeeze it together and spit out another embedding, a single embedding for two words. So the reduction network is for taking two words, uh, it'll do the reduction, and spit out uh, a single uh, uh, embedding outside. So the one of the e e easy part of, or one of the, the, the beauty of PyTorch abstraction, the NN module is, you can inherit from the NN dot module, and you can just create any layer that you want by using the layers, def layers that has defined already. So in the init, I'm trying to initialize NN dot linear uh, with the size uh, of the, uh, of the uh, number of neurons. And then in the forward pass, I'm taking the left, left word, I'm taking the right word, and passing that to the tree LSTM and getting the uh, output embedding back. Cool. So, okay. So the, this is probably the longest reason, uh, the, or probably the strongest reason. It supports dynamic graphs, right? Uh, so uh, all other popular framework, as I said, supports static graphs, and the dynamic the dynamic capability of a graph has a lot of potential. It's super powerful, and I'm going to show you how it is powerful. Okay, so these are the three major limitations that I found with static graphs. If, if your neural network structure is dependent on the data, it's super difficult for you to implement that in a static graph, right? So you're defining your graph outside, and when you iterate your data, only when you iterate through your data, you get the structure of your input data. And if you want, your, if, if you want to build a neural network that has a structure depends on the data, it's extremely dif difficult to implement in a static graph. But since in PyTorch it's happening dynamically, you can do it on the fly. You can create your graph on the fly. And a typical example would be uh, sequence data. So you will have to have uh, a sequence unit for each word in your data. And uh, actually, all the static graph framework has work around like tf.y loop or tf.dynamic RNN. But what PyTorch offers is you can use the language primitives or language constructs, and you can implement it by your own. You can just put a for loop inside your forward function, and you can have the dynamic capability. You don't have to learn uh, a new construct like tf.y loop to implement a dynamic capability in your, in your graph. OK, the next point is it's also really important, especially in the field of reinforcement learning in natural language processing as well. Uh, so if your input. If, if your neural network structure is, depends on the computation happening inside your network, there is no way, other than you do some hacks, a static graph could implement that, right? I have a, 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 a super good example for this too. And the third point is, if you are into research and if you want to change the gradient or weight on the fly, uh, it's very difficult to do that in uh, a static graph. But it's super natural and intuitive in a dynamic graph like PyTorch. So basically, the, after all, all the reason why the deep learning framework exists is to 
make the life of a developer easy, right? But when you start approaching a new problem, when you start conceptualizing a, a, a new problem or prototyping something, what static graphs does is it restricts the way you think. You have to be in this box that has a lot of constraints. And you have to be inside and think how you could approach that particular problem. But uh, dynamic graph is actually opening up that box for you. And so this is the example that I was talking about. Uh, this, is a, this is a research done in Nat uh, Stanford Natural Language Inference Group. Uh, so basically, it, it, it tries to address the two problems that I was talking about uh, by, by implementing it in dynamic graph. Um, so this particular problem has neural network structure depends on the input data. And neural network structure uh, depends on the computation happening inside the network. So the problem is this. Uh, you have a sentence. Okay, I'm not going to define the whole problem. I just define uh, what we need here. Uh, so the, the problem is to do sentence classification. You get a sentence, and you do classification on that sentence. right? So the, the way they approach the sentence classification problem is what makes dynamic graphs implementation is much more easier than static graph implementation. So I have a typical example here. The church has cracks in the ceiling. So they have... 500k sentences uh, that actually parsed and put it as a parse tree. Uh, so basically, it's parsed based on the phrases. Uh, the church is a uh, verbal phrase, I guess. No, it's a noun phrase. Hash cracks in the ceiling is a verb phrase, and in the ceiling is a prepositional phrase. So you have this parsed data in, with you, and you are you are approaching this in another way. You put this another. Uh, list with you that has the operation that you should do at any point of time. S means shift and R means reduce. So reduce is what we have seen before, the reduction network. And basically how we are trying to approach this problem is when the parser uh, list says it is S, we try to push one word from that buffer of input sentence to a stack. When it says reduce, we pop two words from the stack and do the reduction and push it back to the stack. OK, I have uh, a representation for that. So this is the transition list that you have that has the operations in it. And that's the buffer you have that has the word in it. And you have a stack. So when it says uh, S, you shift the word. So we have one more S. You shift the next word. And then it says R. So what you are going to do is you pop these two words from the stack, do the reduction. It will pass through that reduce network that I have defined. and push that sentence embedding back to, or the embedding that you got back to the stack. So that's reduce, and we have a couple of shift, and then we do a couple of R, so it'll all, always pop from the, uh, the top two and do the reduction, and we have one more shift, but that's a full stop, and two more reduction. So after this process, you get the sentence embedding. Yes, this is what your sentence embedding is, right? So the problem that I was talking about is this, the sentence length, or this the length of transition list can be varied, right? And that's actually what is difficult to implement in a static graph, because it's the, the length of that list is entirely depends on the input data that you have. And you have an if-else case there. If the transition list says it is a yes, you push that word to the stack. You're not doing any uh, neural network operation. But if that is an R, you pass that, you pop that two words, and push that to uh, and pass that to the reduce network that you have. So there's a neural network operation. You have to build the graph if it is an R. So you have this efals condition check in your network, uh, and which I don't even I, I don't know even TensorFlow Fold can implement the efals problem. Uh, it can it can address the dynamic uh, the sequence length problem. Okay, so this is the sentence classifier, the abstract. I I don't want you guys to look any of uh, the code other than the 66th line. Uh, which is where the particular problem that I was uh, uh, saying is going to be in the spin module. So the left-hand side is a spin network, and the right-hand side is my uh, training code. So uh, like I said, it's, so in uh, the 14th line, it's trying to loop through that transition, which could be varied for each data. And in this box, it's trying, it's doing that if-else check, right? If there is a reduce, it has to create the graph or the reduction graph and, the, and do the reduction operation. Okay, in the right-hand side, I have uh, the training uh, loop. 
So uh, you have the Optim module in Torch that has all the optimization algorithm like RMS Prop or Atom or Red Adult or uh, so and so. And you define that and you pass your model's parameter to it. So basically all the model parameter is a variable that has data and that has grad in it. So the Optim package got all the variable that has grad and data in it. And when it do with the backward, it calculates the grad. And when you do op dot step, optim dot step, it takes the value from the grad and update your data. Really simple. Cool. Okay, so this is the third point, uh, easy debugging. So if you guys have used TensorFlow before, I'm pretty sure you guys have feel the, feel the pain of debugging in TensorFlow, right? It's, re it's really a mess. So you, so the problem is when you, when you put your, when, when, you, when, when your code breaks, when, the, when your neural network breaks, what you're going to get is the, the graph definition that you have written, TensorFlow has created an execution engine based out of that. So when your code breaks, what you're going to get back is a traceback from a set of code which is not written by you, and which is, pro which is probably you're not going to understand easily because it's really complex. And you have to scroll through three or four pages of terminal error and uh, error to find where exactly the error occurs, right? It's really uh, painful. Uh, but since PyTorch is imperative, you exactly, you, know, if you can use maybe a breakpoint or some print in Python and find where exactly your code bre breaks and you can fix it. Cool. Uh, the last point is control over the data and grad. So I was talking to one of my friend, especially about this PyTorch NumPy conversion, and he said to me, uh, I've never been so close to the weights or the gradients. So that's exactly the thing, right? You, you, you have access to your data or the gradient at any point of time in your graph. In, in, let it be the, in the for loop. Let it be in, in mid of your training. You don't have to call the session and turn, return back your data from the session to uh, understand what exactly happening in a particular part. You can just print that particular variable and you get it uh, there in your terminal. OK, uh, looks like I do have time for the bonus. Uh, so. PyTorch actually created for, as a research framework, but what Facebook offered is uh, they, build, they will build this interop between PyTorch and Cafe 2 real soon. And once that is done, it is like TensorFlow and TFServe. So you can, once you, you build your, your, you prototype your model in PyTorch and you migrate that to Cafe 2, and then you are ready to go in any devices because Cafe 2 is optim optimized for mobile devices as well, and it has a pretty good serving module as per Facebook. Okay, uh, so PyTorch, another thing that PyTorch lacks is the visualization option. Py PyTorch does not have any visualization options yet, officially, but people have tried different approaches to visualize uh, the network, and what PyTorch core developers thought is, TensorBoard is amazing, you don't have to build something again. We can just use TensorBoard, and uh, there will be an official integration between PyTorch and TensorBoard real soon. Uh, okay, so this is something that I've used in an encoder decoder network that I have created. So you will have access to all the code that I have used in the uh, PPT in uh, GitHub repo. Uh, so uh, this is actually trying to unroll all the sequence in my uh, uh, encoder decoder network. Or you can actually print the decoder object, or, so I'm trying to print the decoder object here. So uh, the return of that forward, the class that you have defined, uh, that you are inherited from an dot module, you'll just print it, and you will get the structure of uh, your object. Okay, so this is, I have used uh, this guy's um, GitHub repo. I cannot read that name. Uh, so uh, so it, 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 the code is in it's GitHub gist, so it's again the error uh, and cost of the encoder decoder network that I was talking about. So this is the representation in TensorBoard, which took the loss and the inf uh, information from PyTorch and brought it for you. So there is another guy called Lanpa. So he has done a pretty amazing job creating probably all the features of TensorBoard integration with PyTorch. You can go and check it out. Okay, so I was actually planning to do benchmarking. But when I started, when I Googled it, I thought I shouldn't be doing this because I've, I've started using PyTorch maybe three last two months and I've never felt 
PyTorch is slower than TensorFlow in any point of time. Uh, and I never seen in Google any anybody saying PyTorch is slower. In fact, TensorFlow's GitHub issues list has almost five issues says TensorFlow is slower than PyTorch. So I'm happy. Uh, okay, so these are the links that you could go and find uh, the couple of benchmarks done by different people. Okay, so I think I'm done. Uh, oh, nine minutes. Okay, so uh, this is the QR code you could scan to get access to all the links that I have. And yeah, so you can connect me by using HS second my tag. Cool. Uh, I'm open for some questions. Hi. Uh, so uh, I've been facing the similar issues in TensorFlow, TensorFlow mm -hmm. and I shifted to PyTorch recently. Okay. And uh, I think PyTorch is really good. Uh, but are there any loopholes for uh, PyTorch during production? Because the PyTorch developers have said that they built PyTorch for research, whereas TensorFlow is built for production. Mm -hmm. But I have not faced any issues uh, for uh, PyTorch during mm -hmm. production. So have you faced any? I haven't either. So uh, I am using, so the face recognition that we have built uh, was in TF, some part of that in TF. So we migrate the whole to code to PyTorch. And that's how I started, and it's running in production. We don't have any issues yet. Okay. Secondly, um, are the uh, the memory optimizations which MXNet has proposed, like uh, recomputations of the ReLU and uh, uh, batch normalization, right. is it uh, no. available in PyTorch? PyTorch does not have that. Okay. So Thank probably you. that's those are a couple of the reasons why they are saying it's for research because there are no uh, optimization like the extra thing that PyTorch code does for you. All right, thanks. Cool. Thanks, guys.